With the existence of a sixth sense being proven, the issue became how the brain actually uses this information. The most interesting scientific insight on this question thus far perhaps comes from author and experimental scientist Walter Rawls. Rawls started with the work of Robin Baker, who, years after he first conducted his direction experiments in Manchester, discovered magnetic deposits in the brain surrounding the pineal gland. Perhaps, thought Rawls, it was the pineal gland which would provide the key to this mysterious sixth sense. He began to conduct an experiment in which he would wear a mask that held a magnet directly over his pineal gland for 10 to 30 minutes at a time. During the first week, as he sat and worked quietly wearing the mask, he suddenly noticed something out of the corner of his eye. When he turned his head to see what it was, it looked at Rawls, then disappeared. Why haven't we done it before? It's just the technology wasn't viable. So it's still too crazy and too early to do this for human beings at scale. So we started working with dogs. We started prototyping. And my partner in crime here is a brilliant veterinarian by the name of Bruce Smith. He's a veterinary oncologist. They're kind of unicorns. There's only 300 of them in the United States, and he's the only one that I'm aware of that has a PhD in molecular biology and has actually made viruses to kill cancer cells. He's a wonderful man. And together we prototyped the synthetic production of something called K adenovirus 2. It's a weak virus, but it had never been synthesized from scratch. It's the largest synthetic virus that's ever been made. We did this last year. It was successful. We made synthetic DNA. We booted it up in cell culture. We validated it against the natural virus. It's perfect. The only reason why we haven't treated a dog yet is because it's such a weak virus, the cancer cells it needs to grow on grow faster than the virus can infect them. We're fixing that now. But this is essentially a 3D printed cancer medicine. And it's only going to get better as we start to iterate this. This was the foundation of the company we just put together a few weeks ago to be able to drive this forward, where each animal treated is essentially a whole drug development program run at a cost that's going to get very quickly the equivalent of an off-the-shelf drug. My goal is to give better cancer treatment to dogs in the short term than people get. And eventually to miniaturize and computerize this whole process and build it into a pen, a drug company and a stick that you can just throw in your glove box in your medicine cabinet and just download that medicine <laughs> as you need it, as we were talking about this morning. Now, this isn't just me, and it's not just drugs. This is an entire emerging industry of programmable nanotechnology. Since it started around 2000, it's really growing exponentially. The number, by any measurement, number of papers, number of participants. I've had the great pleasure of working with students over the last decade at a program called iGEM that was started at MIT and based on US First, the international robotics program. And I absolutely love working with these kids. These are kids that have never been in a lab before. They've grown up digital. And they do work that is PhD worthy by working in small teams and using these incredibly powerful genetic engineering tools that large pharma companies would have just done anything for a couple of decades ago. It's, it's a real phase shift in biotechnology. We're starting to see an industry blossom. CB Insights tallied them up a few weeks ago. It's over 60 different companies working in every area you can imagine, biology touching food and drink, consumer products, healthcare, industrial chemicals, fuels, platforms. It's there was over $1.3 billion invested in these companies by VCs last year alone. Some of my friends at MIT that helped get this stuff rolling went on and founded a company called Ginkgo Bioworks. It's one of the most successful. It's all robotic. Another company more recent is Zymergen. They're focusing on materials. Again, robots. You do not want people doing liquid management. And these robotic labs are now going cloud. 
This is a company called Transcriptic. It is a programmable laboratory in a shipping container. Eventually, it'll get smaller. It is so much fun doing this work because you can actually do state-of-the-art biotech from your living room. So what's the bottleneck? The bottleneck right now is DNA synthesis. You saw how quickly sequencing dropped in price. DNA synthesis has not had that acceleration yet. It is, it is decreasing exponentially in cost, or depending on how you look at it, increasing exponentially in price performance, but it hasn't had that wicked acceleration that we saw with sequencing as next generation technologies came about. It's coming though, very soon. The more DNA you can write, the longer you can write it, the more interesting stuff you can make. With synthetic biology, you can start doing metabolic engineering. Now you can build pathways, not just single proteins. And what's still science fiction is being able to do large genomes, essentially write whole chromosomes or lots of chromosomes to build complex genomes like ours or the mouse. And the result was something called gene GP write, genome project write, as opposed to genome project read. Part of it. Now, I just want to say there's no synthetic babies here. Anyway, register now. There's probably only a couple of spots left, but this is where you need to be if you're interested in building genomes. And again, there will be no synthetic babies. This is just being able to write large, complex genomes. And these meetings bring everyone together, the ethicists, they bring together the scientists, they bring together the policy folks, they bring together the funders. This is not about any single project. You may have seen this last week, it could get a little weird in the future. It's because whatever we make when we program carbon, we become the parents of. You'll hear from Mark Goodman later today. Mark Goodman is one of my favorite people because he is so paranoid that the world is just going to blow up. <laughs> but when we get together, we have a few shots. Well, he doesn't drink. But when I have a few shots, weird things happen, like articles about biohacking and hacking the president. So to kind of put a bow on all this, life is fully reusable and